Thank you uh, to the IPC for the uh, invitation to speak in the IPC symposium. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today. And uh, those are my disclosures. And I'll be presenting a pediatric case, which I think was uh, challenging in the diagnosis and challenging in treatment. This was a nine-year-old Egyptian boy from my country. And he was referred from the pediatrics department to the psoriasis unit uh, where I work, the Castellani psoriasis unit for assessment. The child was born to consanguineous parents, and he had no family history of psoriasis. The child had plucked psoriasis on the arms and legs and scalp psoriasis. He had no arthritis and no nail affection. And the onset of psoriasis started when he was six years of age. And at presentation, his PASI was 12.8. However, the presentation was not that simple. And that's because this child had long history of different systemic symptoms dating back since infancy before he developed psoriasis later on at the age of six, and for which uh, these systemic symptoms, the pediatrician thoroughly investigated to reach a precise diagnosis. So let's start the story from the uh, very beginning. During the first uh, year of life, this child suffered from severe persistent watery diarrhea, and examination revealed hepatosplenomegaly. The pediatricians investigated uh, the condition, and the investigations revealed that the viral serology was negative. Gastrointestinal endoscopy revealed intraepithelial lymphocyte infiltration in a celiac-like pattern, so that initially the child was thought to have celiac disease. However, the anti-tissue transglutaminases, which are known to be sensitive and specific for celiac disease, turned out to be negative. The abdominal ultrasound and liver biopsy showed that the liver had distorted architecture and portal fibrosis. So at this point, the child was suspected to have autoimmune disease, query celiac disease, or he may, may have a lymphoproliferative disease that leads to the proliferation of the lymphocyte in the gastrointestinal system and in other organs. Later on in life, at the age of three years before the development of psoriasis, the child, in addition, suffered from severe anemia and thrombocytopenia. Investigations revealed positive diarrhea Combs test, and bone marrow aspirate revealed hypercellularity, which indicated that the problem was not in the bone marrow production, but in the autoimmune breakdown of the RBCs. And so the child now also have autoimmune hemolytic anemia and immune uh, thrombocytopenia. So this adds another piece to the puzzle, that the child probably has an autoimmune disorder order, and the anemia was very severe that the child required frequent blood transfusions. Uh, the white blood cell count in the CBC was normal. However, the pediatrician proceeded to investigate the immunoglobulins levels and the immunophenotyping of the white blood cells. And here we had another positive findings. The child had low level of IgM and IgA, and immunophenotypings of the B cells showed low number of the B cells. So this indicated that the child has humoral immune defect. In addition, there was a defect in the regulatory T cells on, or in the T-Rex. And this add another piece to the puzzle that besides the autoimmunity and the, lympho and the query lymphoproliferation, the child also has immunodeficiency. Later on, in the period between three and six years of age, immediately before the child developed psoriasis, he also had recurrent attacks of pneumonia. And this was explained with the underlying immunodeficiency. And then at the age of six, we turn back to the start point where the child developed pluck psoriasis, and he was referred to the psoriasis unit, and the diagnosis was confirmed by biopsy. So we wondered what can sum up these puzzle pieces together, having psoriasis, autoimmunity, lymphoproliferation, and immunodeficiency. And of course, in order to reach a precise diagnosis, this required a lot of collaboration between the pediatrics department and the psoriasis unit. Together, we reviewed the literature, had discussion. We have been through a lot of syndromes, and we have reviewed the literature again, and so on. And finally, we could reach an entity in the literature that can explain the, the child uh, presentation, and that's called LRPA deficiency. We will be explaining uh, this disorder after a minute, but accordingly, the child was further investigated, and it was confirmed that he had marked deficiency of the LRPA protein in that disorder, and it was confirmed by genetic diagnosis where the child was found to have mutation in the gene coding for the LRPA protein, and finally, the child was diagnosed with LRPA deficiency. So what's LRPA deficiency? As it sounds, it's a rare disorder. It's an autosomal recessive disorder. And LRPA is an acronym that stands for lipopolysaccharide responsive and page-like anchor protein. Uh, 
that is orders characterized by autoimmunity, lymphoproliferation, and immune deficiency, and present with variable presentations. Many of them was, was present in our child, including chronic diarrhea, hypogammaglobinemia, organomegaly, recurrent infections, and autoimmune disorders. So what is the function of this LRPA uh, protein? As we can see in the diagram, above it, the T regs, and down in the antigen presenting cell, and to the right side, the T cells. As we know that there is an inhibitory ligand present on the surface of the Tregs called the CTLA4 ligand, and this ligand acts by binding to the CD8086 ligand on the antigen presenting cell to present the binding of the antigen presenting cell to the CD28 ligand on the surface of the T cells, and this maintains the inhibitory function of the regulatory T cells. The, L the LRPA protein function is to prevent the breakdown of this CTLA4 ligand, and therefore the LRPA serves to have an abandoned expression of the C CTLA4 on the surface of the Tregs, and this maintains the regulatory function of the Tregs. However, in children suffering from the LRPA deficiency, like in our child, this breakdown is uninhibited, and therefore there is extensive degradation of the CTLA4, and therefore this decreased expression of the ligand of, on the surface of the Tregs, and therefore instead the IPC, uh, the antigen-presenting cell, bind to the uh, CD28 surface on, on the surface of the T cells, and this results in stimulation of the T cells and the autoimmunity that's presented in the disease and was present in our child. The next question is what connects the LRPA deficiency to psoriasis? We thought of two explanations. The first one is, as we just mentioned, that the LRPA deficiency, there is stimulation of the T cells and autoimmunity, and this is shared pathogenesis in psoriasis. The second explanation is that these children suffer from recurrent infections due to immunodeficiency, and in addition, they may receive therapies like systemic corticosteroids for the autoimmune process going on, and as we know that recurrent infections and systemic therapies can trigger the development of psoriasis. Psoriasis was reported to be associated with LRPA deficiency in two cases previously reported in the literature, and this child was the uh, third case. So the second challenge was how to, to treat the child. The child, uh, the pediatrician already started the child on systemic corticosteroids and immunosuppressives, including cyclosporin and adacyprine together to, in order to control the autoimmune process. In addition, the child received IVIG for the immunodeficiency. For psoriasis, we tried many sequential therapies. We started with topical calcipotriol beta-methazone ointment, which showed modest response. Of course, mesotrexate was not an option because the child has anemia and liver fibrosis. We tried to increase the dose of cyclosporin. We tried acetretin. We even tried um, unusual conventional therapies like serolimus because it was reported in the literature that can be beneficial for LRPA deficiency, and there were some reports um, in psoriasis, but there was no improvement. So somehow this, uh, this child psoriasis was resistant to treatment. And during the journey of treatment, the child uh, had another attack of infection, which triggered erythrodermic psoriasis, as you can see in the photos. The general condition of the child deteriorated, and he needed hospitalization. And the pediatrician needed, again, to start systemic steroids, together, of course, with, for antibiotics for the infection. And the child was hospitalized. And luckily, with the controlling of infection and the treatment of the general condition, erythroderma resolved. And after four months, the patient's skin was almost clear and his general condition was stable. And afterwards, he was prepared for bone marrow transplantation, which is the definitive treatment of the LRPA uh, deficiency. Um, this case was published as a case report in the Journal of the German Society of Dermatology. And I'd like to thank all my colleagues who shared in the diagnosis and the treatment of this child. And here we come to the conclusion. This is a case of LRPA deficiency that presented with plaque psoriasis. And I think that the take-home message that particularly in pediatric psoriasis assessment is very important, especially when children have systemic symptoms, we can consider systemic disorder. And this is particularly important because sometimes, like in our child, the, the treatment of the general condition and controlling the infection can improve uh, psoriasis. And here I come to the end. Thank you very much for your attention.